uh, paved highways than Alaska, uh, and uh, 1,500 miles of land border. So there's a lot of border that we're focused on. There's a lot of travel. There's a lot of trade. Uh, Ted Stevens, uh, I think it's the uh, fourth largest cargo uh, transit hub. Uh, and then finally, uh, CISA, right? So our Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Look, cybersecurity is a, a, a evolving uh, threat across the nation, across uh, the entire world. So people tend to think of CISA as, oh, cybersecurity is there something particular about Alaska, equally at threat, equally vulnerable. Uh, but I would say, you know, unpack the acronym a little bit more, cybersecurity and infrastructure, infrastructure security agency, and CISA plays a big role in that. Thank you very, mm -hmm. very much. That comprehensive response to that. Uh, you mentioned that um, we're going to stay. We're going to stay on task here. But you mentioned a, a number of things that I just want to follow up on. The, the perspective of DHS and other federal agencies about the Arctic, it's 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 growing. We're, we're more informed. We're more, all collectively more aware of the importance of the Arctic for a lot of different reasons. You noted that. Let me let me just ask the reverse of that. What do you think homeland security means uh, to the people of the Arctic? Those who we all must serve. Yep. Um, thanks. And, and again, Mike, you know, you're an expert because you're a citizen. Uh, you're an expert because you're you <laughs> and your long history in terms of uh, looking at this space in an important and many different ways. Uh, but for us, from the Department of Homeland Security, when we look at the 730,000 people, roughly, right, roughly 730,000 people who live in Alaska, I think the first thing that comes to our mind is and it's, a, again, doubles twice you know, the biggest state by far by land mass. One of the things that concerns us, and, you know, just to put it in context, 730,000 people in Alaska makes it roughly on the size of District of Columbia, literally where we sit today. Now, if uh, anybody's gone out and I'm looking around in the room, there's probably a lot of folks online. If you walked outside your door, if you happen to be in the district or in the National Capital Region now, uh, you know, we're pretty densely populated here. Like, there's not a lot of green space here. Uh, in the District of Columbia, uh, and it's tiny, it's super tiny. And then you compare it to Alaska, 730,000 people. Where am I going with this, you know, um, sort of comparison is, this is a state that if something bad happens, and there's lots of different bad things, there's lots of different threats out there, but certainly if we just take a look at natural disaster, it is uh, by far the least densely populated state in the United States of America. And when we have, and again, uh, David, who I'm pointing to here, you know, from FEMA certainly knows this, when something, when there's a natural disaster, what is, there, look, we bring in FEMA, we bring in a bunch of other nonprofits, and the community comes together, but one of the things that you can always sort of count on is that you're able to surge local resources, you can even surge regional resources uh, uh, from the United States of America. But by definition, Alaska and Hawaii are well outside the, you know, but the contiguous continental United States, which means that when we look at the security of uh, Alaska, in particular the Department of Homeland Security, we need to find new, novel, and increased ways to help uh, make this state even more resilient uh, than it is now. I think the other place that we go to, uh, especially within the Biden-Harris administration, is our focus and our significantly increased engagement uh, with the tribes, with uh, the Native Americans, uh, uh, who the Native Alaskans who live uh, in Alaska. There is, again, by our count, about 229 mm -hmm. uh, tribes uh, rep are represented in Alaska. Pretty amazing. That is 40 percent of uh, all of the tribes, you know, who are in the United States of America. And as a result of that, one of the things that we've done is we've done a lot of consultations with them, uh, especially after the national strategy for the Arctic region was developed. We did, we did a consultation with them in um, December. And then in September, more broadly, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, put together a tribal co uh, council. We have, you know, Homeland Security Advisory Council and things of that nature. We put together a tribal council. Uh, with 15 uh, tribes, and two of those tribes uh, are largely represented coming out of Alaska. Uh, so your question was, you know, what does it mean for the people of Alaska? I think it's about uh, building resilience uh, to national disasters. It's about making sure their, uh, their critical infrastructure uh, is uh, more intact and, and ready for attacks, whether it's cyber 
maybe it's natural disaster or other. Uh, it's understanding who makes up uh, the people in Alaska and also their economic well-being, and then also appreciating uh, the effect of climate change, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some more. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you. Let, let's, let's, let's go there then. You know, last fall, um, Typhoon Murbuck devastated communities throughout western Alaska in, in a way that, I mean, you could see news reports, you could read about it, uh, but unless you see what that typhoon did, just like any of our natural disasters, they're, <coughs> all, they're all horrible. Uh, but in communities, as you noted, that are disconnected from other small communities that are not in the surge uh, framework to get any resource there, whatever's there is what you get to use, whether it's duct tape and bailing wire or, or you know, make a call. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a rough place to try to address uh, a, an emergency like that, and we predict, the research community predicts, that there's just going to be more. Yeah. There'll be more of them and more intense. So, you know, it's it's way up on our radar in the state, but, of course, in, in Alaska as well. So to follow up on that, uh, you, you mentioned some of the things you're doing to engage with communities. Maybe you can expand on that a little bit more and talk about the ways in which DHS is supporting these communities to manage climate change, not the particular typhoon were, that, that hit Alaska in the fall, but in the broader sense, this idea that climate is adaptation and mitigation, what, what role does DHS have in that? Well, again, um, you know, David, you're getting set up really well here. Uh, there's going to be a, t a ton of things that you can talk about during the panel. W one, one of the, let's first talk about typhoon, Maribach. Uh, you know, there, it, it's interesting when you look at all of the different natural disasters that have happened in the United States of America really over the last year. I bet you, not this poll, you, you are a bit of the choir here on Alaska, but if we were to go to an informed audience, Typhoon Merbach probably wouldn't be up there, right? Uh, it, it didn't make nearly as much news as the, you know, the wildfires in California, for instance, uh, but the ferocity, the impact, the breadth of it, and, uh, you know, probably more lucky than good by far, right? And this is, of course, uh, Mother Nature and weather, uh, although we can have impact to that. Yeah. And we'll, you know, we'll talk, you know, talk about climate change here in a moment. Uh, it was uh, fierce. And I, I think, you know, again, given the, the – we don't want to have to count on this, right? Because the people of Alaska, the 229 tribes, the 730,000 people don't want to count – on whether the, t another typhoon like that of that scale or any other similar natural disaster were to hit a, pop uh, a, a hugely populated like Fairbanks or, or something of that nature uh, or Anchorage. Uh, you know, fortunately, it wasn't massive from my understanding in terms of where it hit, but you know, the, uh, the people's homes uh, who were hit uh, and their livelihoods uh, in, their, in the fisheries and things of that nature what we did was, and, you know, look, hats off to the United States Coast Guard and to FEMA. Really, those, those two organizations, I looked down at for Admiral Ryan and Director Kang here, uh, they, we were quick on it. Uh, you know, we're not looking for a pat on the back, uh, but we were on the ground very, very quickly. The, uh, we came together. We led uh, task forces. We, we, we talked to the stakeholders immediately. And I think, you know, that doesn't, you know, the, the Coast Guard, when people think of Coast Guard and FEMA come together, what do they tend to think of? Especially highly populated areas, especially over the last six months, Florida, right? You know, and, that, and, that, and that's what's uh, making the news. Well, with that same level of commitment from the United States Coast Guard, Semper Paratus, Admiral Ryan, uh, and from FEMA, uh, that we brought uh, in terms of the level of professionalism, the level of care, and the level of interest to our fellow citizens. Uh, we brought in Florida, right, for the hurricanes recently there and the big storms and the storm surges in places like Tampa and south of Tampa, uh, we brought into Alaska. I think that's very specifically to Typhoon Merbuck, but I think that is also representative of the kind of capability and capacity that we'll continue to bring you know, one of the things, and, you know, we should, um, Ambassador, you should ask David this question again. Uh, I mean, he'll be able to go into more detail. Uh, but we've got a lot of uh, mitigation groups and resilience uh, task forces and working groups. And fortunately, and it makes sense, uh, the people of Alaska, the uh, local governments and the organizations are interested in talking to us about how we do this. W one of the things that we are kind of concerned about, and I think you all are as well, is around food scarcity. Uh, and especially how a natural disaster can take that away very quickly. Yeah, that, I appreciate you saying that because, it, you know, it, 
when you see a, a disaster on, on television that happens in more populated areas, it's about generation of electricity, fuel tank leak, I mean, all, all, of, those, all of those incredibly devastating issues. But when you're talking about a place that's not as populated as other places of our country, that live in rhythm with the landscape, this is subsistence lifestyle. And when you rip apart that fiber because of a, because of a typhoon, it goes far beyond repairing homes. And by the way, homes were floating away. And it would happen right before breakup, right before freeze up. So we're talking about going from the summer fall into the winter with flooded homes. And, and the understanding, it's important, I guess, what I'm saying is giving kudos here to DHS. It's important to understand the perspective, the perspective that it might not be 10 million people. Mm -hmm. It's 500 people. But those 500 people are relying on a lifeline that's a long way away. And the battle rhythm to address that is really important and working early on with communities, and we see this happening. So hats off to DHS and to the federal members of the family here to, to think about the Arctic in a very different way. And I think what you have just said does that. It thinks about the Arctic and prepares for a changing Arctic in a very different way than maybe even just a few years ago. Well, thank you on behalf of FEMA and behalf of the Coast Guard and others. Yeah. So it, we have about uh, five or six minutes left. I'd like to take you from the, is that right, Becca, I'm looking at, yeah, that's right, okay. So um, I, wanna take, I wanna take you from the, the very uh, local and regional scale to maybe the, the broader, mm. broader scale, looking at larger geopolitics and maybe just the, gl the globalized Arctic, the Arctic in a global context. We talk a lot about working with allies and partners, mm. right? Our whole government approach, allies and partners, how, and certainly the, the war on Ukraine has heightened uh, heightened our sensitivity to it all, but also has reinforced how the United States must lead and be integrated into this, this family of allies and partners. Maybe you could talk about DHS's role there in terms of working with allies and partners in an Arctic context. No, I appreciate that. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to tack to two or three different things here, uh, and I think answer your question almost directly in each one of them. The, the first thing is, you know, I think everybody in this room uh, both the in-person room, the virtual room, certainly in your community, uh, the Wilson Center, the Polar Institute, should be heartened, should be heartened by the fact that uh, the Arctic was featured so prominently in the national security strategy uh, that we literally have a, a national strategy on the Arctic region, the NSAR, you spoke about uh, both of those, uh, that DOD has a Department of Defense, uh, you know, a fellow department up here in the in the. Uh, federal government has a, a strategy uh, committed uh, to the Arctic region, and that the Department of Homeland Security obviously has a strategy that is uh, part and parcel uh, part of the national strategy for the Arctic region and part of the national security strategy. Uh, that's a big deal. Like, I know it feels probably policy focused, uh, but I think uh, Mike, certainly the ambassador, uh, knows this, Ambassador Green, you know, who you read his comments, certainly know this. Uh, po policy is important because from policy drives resources, policy drives prioritization, and the Arctic is absolutely a big priority, and newly so, I, I feel like, over the last uh, couple of years in, in the understanding. Okay, so the, the good news is it, it's uh, prioritized. Uh, the good news is that Department of Homeland Security, as I spoke about before, both how we view uh, the Arctic region, in particular Alaska, as uh, Homeland Security, National Security, but also for the people, the good people of Alaska, and what we can and should be doing to support them. Uh, how are we executing on that? Uh, you know, effectively, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard is our lead in so many different ways. Our lead in terms of freedom of navigation, of international uh, law and order, of um, uh, making sure that unregulated uh, fishing on the high seas. There's an international agreement uh, that was uh, negotiated and ratified uh, over the last year and signed, by the way, so this is before Ukraine, you know, uh, signed, uh, by the way, by not only all the Arctic nations, but also by Russia and China, right? So again, it was, it was a great example now of multilateral uh, cooperation to again, you know, make sure that there was not unregulated fishing, which we know is so difficult and really uh, impactful uh, to the local economies, and as you noted, a, a sustainable economy uh, partially through fishing. And this is uh, this is an international agreement. It's uh, not, I wouldn't say unprecedented, uh, but it's pretty impressive in its breadth, uh, also in its length. I mean, it's going to go until 2037, until 2037, and even then it has an automatic clause that it will continue to renew every five years. So look, I'm a glass half full person here. I'm an optimist by nature. 
uh, but I'm also a clear eyed realist. So uh, what we need to do is to make sure the United States Coast Guard uh, is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and they will, Semper Paratus, Admiral Ryan, uh, to make sure that uh, they'll do their big part, and they're pretty significant in terms of uh, unregulated fishing, IUUF in general, especially those countries. I think here's the other thing, too, in terms of the reality. Um, with the melting uh, permafrost, uh, with there being, and I mentioned this in my, some of my opening comments, that there's going to be more uh, places that you can navigate. Freedom of navigation is going to be important. I think there's going to be more um, economic flow coming through the Arctic region. This is going to be another way for, um, you know, trade and supply chains to, to flow. And so that's good. Glass half full says this is terrific. This is better for the global economy. It's probably, you know, almost by definition better for the local economies. Uh, but when you have that, glass half full, clear-eyed realist, got to be balanced in these sorts of things. Uh, it's going to be more global competition. So, again, pretty important uh, that we're there. Coast Guard, again, Admiral Ryan can talk uh, even more to it. Great. Thank you. I know we've got just a couple more, a couple of minutes left, maybe one or two. Rebecca, thank you. <clears throat> so I, uh, I like the fact that you, you created this Venn diagram of DOD policy, DHS policy, national strategy for the Arctic region, now led by, uh, you reference Ambassador, Ambassador Dave Bolton and as Executive Director of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, the NSAR, the National Security Strategy. When you start threading them all together, you get a far better picture of where the federal government is going vis-a-vis -vis the, the Arctic. It's, it's, it's strategies, but trying to weave them together and then, then enable them independent, but then, then, then together. Uh, so I, I like the way you have framed that and what DHS's role is in there. The, the last final, the final question is, let's, let's just follow up lastly on economic development. Mm. So whether it's uh, shipping routes or, or other dimensions of, of trade and, and commercialization, what role, D, what role does DHS have in, to support economic development? Maybe not global economic development, sure. right? Because that, that commodity markets will drive a lot of things. But, but, but for America's Arctic, for, for Alaska and, and, the, and regionally with Washington and others, uh, and let's not forget, you know, the state of Maine, as mm -hmm. Senator King likes to remind That's us. Right. Right. He likes to be the other Arctic state. <laughs> and we don't argue with Senator King. Right. right. But, but in terms of DHS, what, give us a couple of examples of the role that DHS plays in enhancing economic development in that particular region? Well, um, you know, ambas uh, uh, the ambassador will probably question uh, Admiral Ryan a little bit more to this again. I'm a, you know, it's always good to start off with the United States Coast Guard. And I, again, I'm going to go back to the, to the more um, freedom of navigation and to the waterways because uh, in order and then the uh, unregulated fishing, I mean, I think those two things are so important. Uh, I think to the region, to include the, the state of Maine, because when we talk about freedom of navigation, we're generally not just talking about what's happening over on the western side, uh, but we're really talking about the flow that goes over to, the, you know, to places like Finland and to Sweden uh, and to Iceland and to Norway and to Denmark. And so that's critically important. And one thing I haven't talked about uh, is actually the icebreakers, right? So there's one point where you talk about, uh, look, obviously with the melting, with climate change uh, and with the melting, uh, you know, permafrost, that there's going to be more of that. But the reality is still, Mike, there's a lot of ice out there still too. So uh, our polar icebreaker program is pretty important to that, to uh, enabling uh, the, the ability to continue to move through even, you know, during the, you know, high winter months, the high freeze months. So super important to that, I think, in terms of navigation. I think super important in terms of um, uh, the unregulated fishing. Uh, and really, uh, and again, I think FEMA and CISA are important to this as well. By the way, science and technology, we've got a great directorate uh, led by Undersecretary Dr. Dmitry Kuznov, who is helping develop uh, – him and, and the great s and team are helping to develop different ways that, uh, especially more isolated uh, cities and localities uh, and populations uh, can be even more resilient, not only in terms of dealing with a natural disaster, but also for food scarcity and things of that nature. I think the you know, place I'll, I'll sort of end on is something I referenced before was around trade. Uh, you know, most, oftentimes people think of Customs and Border Protection, uh, they think of the folks in uh, O.D. Green uh, on the southwest border, uh, or they think of the folks who are in uh, Navy Blue, the OFO, Office of Field Operations, the folks who you will see uh, as you come through. You're probably in international travel uh, when, you, when you come through places like JFK uh, or uh, Dulles. Uh, but 
a big part, a big part of CBP's mission is around uh, uh, facilitating free and fair trade. Uh, and again, given that Ted Stevens is the fourth largest uh, cargo uh, airport hub, if we're not there, if DHS is not doing their part uh, in order to su uh, support and safeguard uh, the American people, our homeland and our values, and doing their subtask, what I would call to f free and fair trade, unrelated fishing, uh, I think uh, Alaska and really part of the Arctic region does not uh, do well. And, and look, many of the things that I said up here today, and Mike, I really appreciate the questions, the way you framed them, again, the support here, uh, and you're hearing from me. I look across this audience, I was getting a lot of head nodding here in the audience, so I appreciate you showing up, giving a little positive uh, reinforcement there. But I think it's important for you all to know that we here in the Biden-Harris administration, with me being a representative, uh, the uh, you know second ranking person in the third largest department, understand, appreciate, and, and, and realize what our mission is to make sure that we're doing all the things we should be doing, not only could be doing, but should be doing to achieve the mission of the Department of Homeland Security that with honor and integrity, we will safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values, and that includes the Arctic region, in Alaska in particular, Mike. What a, what a great way to, uh, to end this segment of the program. I, I want you to know, Deputy Secretary, that uh, the way you underscored the importance of that is the way at least I and many others in the Arctic world see it, in that you being here a, is important. What you say is important. What the department does is important. And it, it reverberates throughout the work that we're trying to do, whether it's here in D.C., or elsewhere in the in Alaska, or frankly throughout the Arctic. So it's important to see and hear what you, as a leader, thinks about the Arctic, and then what you're doing about it, and then how it fits better into the rest of the federal government's efforts as well. Would you all please thank me? Uh, please thank our, our. Well, don't you don't have to thank me, <laughs> but if you want to thank me, I'm very happy to stick around later. But but please thank the Deputy Secretary for showing up today and for providing a wonderful insight into the leadership uh, that he and his colleagues are providing in the Department of Homeland Security regarding the Arctic. Thank you very much. I, I just two reminders. One is I'll be available in the back to be thanked uh, later, and and the second is that it's now an honor to turn over the program to uh, Dr. Rebecca Pincus for the next iteration of the program. Rebecca. Thank you to our audience, to the online audience. Just a reminder that if you have questions for the panel that we're about to kick off, please send them via email to polar at wilsoncenter.org. We've got a few submissions already, but please keep them coming in. Thank you very much. And um, I am going to welcome our panel to the stage here and then take a seat for some introductions. Um, I'll, I'll kick those off. You have their bios available, so I'll move quickly through introducing this distinguished panel so we can get to the Q&A. Um, but just a, a couple quick notes on the um, really terrific roster of speakers we have here following the Deputy Secretary. Ambassador David Bolton um, is the Executive Director of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He formerly served as chair of the senior Arctic officials during the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council from 2015 to 2017, and as the ambassador for oceans and fisheries, both of those roles within the State Department. Uh, Dr. Tasha Hippolyte is the deputy assistant secretary for trade and economic security in the Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans at DHS, where she leads policy development to facilitate lawful trade and enforce U.S. trade laws. She also serves as an adjunct professor at American University. Rear Admiral Mike Ryan is Deputy Commandant for Operations, Policy, and Capabilities at the Coast Guard. So he's responsible for establishing and providing operational strategy, policy, and resources to meet priorities for Coast Guard missions in support of the Deputy Commandant for Operations. We have Mr. David Kang, who is Director of the Office of Response and Recovery at FEMA. In this role, he oversees development of interagency and joint 
local, state, and federal response plans, and FEMA's exercises. He also is an adjunct professor both at Georgetown University and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So we have two professors on this panel. Um, finally, we have Mr. Robert Hammer, who is special agent in charge for Homeland Security Investigations, Pacific Northwest Region in DHS. So he's responsible for all Homeland Security investigations in Alaska, as well as Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. So you can see, I think this panel illustrates very well the breadth of DHS components and the wide variety of missions that DHS and its components fulfill in the Arctic region. Um, it's, a, it's a 360 degree picture, really, the variety of things that are going on from investigations, trade, um, Coast Guard, and emergency response. You know, I, th I think we're covering the whole gamut here, so we should have a lot of really interesting questions coming in. Um, I am going to join my panel and kick off. Um, as a note, we have microphones in the room here, so if you have questions, please flag down our mic holder. Um, but I want to take the moderator's privilege of asking the first question here, um, and I'm going to pose this to the whole panel. I would ask that, um, bearing in mind we have a large panel here, let's let's um, keep our responses as, as abbreviated as possible, but I do want to kind of give each one of you a few minutes to offer some introductory comments, um, and talk to us about some of the challenges and opportunities you see in the region. So Ambassador Balton, please kick off. Thanks very much, uh, Rebecca, and thanks very much to the Wilson Center for convening this and for inviting me. So achieving security has long been one of our national interests in the Arctic. This was true during the Cold War. It was true during the 30 years since the Cold War ended, and it's certainly true today. As the region, I would say, is facing twin challenges of increased geopolitical stress and environmental stress in terms of the climate crisis. Over the years, this term security has, of course, broadened. It encompasses not only now national security, but other concepts, economic security, environmental security, food security, and, of course, homeland security. And each one of these elements of security has found its way into the national strategy for the Arctic region. Deputy Secretary mentioned. Uh, for those of you who may not have yet committed the national strategy for the Arctic region to memory, let me remind you it has four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is about security, primarily national security. We, are, we have committed ourselves to improving uh, our understanding of the operating environment in the Arctic, exercising president, presence, and uh, engaging with allies and partners. But each of the other three pillars also have some element of security. Pillar two sets forth actions that we uh, are committed to take to improve environmental security in the Arctic. Uh, pillar three is a broad range of actions to improve economic security. And pillar four has to do with international cooperation and governance that too can support security throughout the region. DHS has key roles to play in all of these, all of these elements. Um, the only thing I will add, because uh, I know we're a little short on time now, uh, a quick update on our efforts to implement the national strategy, for those of you who might be interested. Um, uh, with my colleague Devin Brennan in the audience, we are leading uh, an effort to build an implementation plan uh, that will lay out the next steps our government needs to take to uh, fulfill all of the commitments. One sees the national strategy. We hope to build in timelines and targets and ways to measure uh, progress to hold ourselves accountable. We want to engage in outreach to our partners outside of the executive branch to get their input into this, and we're hoping to have this completed by the end of March. End of March. Unlike the national strategy, which has a 10-year timeline, the implementation plan will have a focus on the next few years with the idea that we'll keep it under review, we'll update it as necessary as circumstances evolve. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the update on the implementation plan. I know we've all been we've all been watching that space. Thank you so much, <clears throat> and thank you, Ambassador. Um, <clears throat> as the Deputy Secretary indicated, um, and as you'll hear on the panel from my esteemed colleagues, DHS has a wide variety of perspectives and expertise, as well as authorities, to help keep the Arctic safe and, and secure. 
And so first of all, I want to certainly thank you, uh, Rebecca, thank you, Mike, certainly, and the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting this and hosting and organizing this, this event. Truly excited to be here and certainly excited to be with my distinguished panelists as well as an ambassador um, from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And so, you know, as I, as I look at my colleagues from U.S. Coast Guard, FEMA, as well as, as ICE, you know, certainly as, as we think about the work that they do, they play a, a leading role in the national security in the Arctic region, right? And that makes uh, them play a critical role and a very pivotal role in the actual security on the ground in Antarctic. And so I think what we'll hear today as we bring this together, um, you'll understand the concept of homeland security and really the role, the strategic role it plays in national security. And certainly that's more evident and more important now, more than ever, I think, in the Arctic region. I want to say a little bit about the national strategy for the Arctic region. Really excited that my team has been, ha been able to kind of lead the department's efforts, working very closely with the components to really represent the department and ensuring that we were um, at the table when the strategy was being developed and as it's being implemented to really hone in on the department's unique uh, perspective, their unique authorities, but really more importantly hone in the concept of homeland security and the role of economic threats and the role of environmental threats and the specific things that DHS can bring to the table. So we're really excited about being a part of that engagement and certainly working with the ambassador on that. Um, as the Deputy Secretary alluded to, another aspect that the department is certainly looking to develop is our engagement um, with the tribal community and the local communities, um, particularly with Native Alaskans. We think that perspective is extremely important. Um, to get the indigenous uh, understanding of what's on the ground in terms of the threats. And that partnership and engagement is going to be something that you'll see with the department engagement early and often as we look to uh, develop our strategies and look at our strategic approaches and our action plans. I certainly had the great fortune of hosting a listening session, um, the National uh, Congress of American Indians. Uh, it was a tribal Arctic listening session, and one of the things that struck me very early was that I had the opportunity to hear firsthand from tribal community and the tribal leaders specifically about the threats, the vulnerabilities from their perspective in the Arctic, and the urging of DHS to consult them and to engage with them as we're looking to address these threats. And we think that's very important for us to do that moving forward. Um, another piece that I'd certainly would li like to add in terms of uh, being able to address some of the challenges. I have the great fortune of being the co-chair of the uh, Bering Task Force. And so the Bering Task Force was uh, established under the Obama administration and certainly reintroduced under the Biden administration in 2021. And it really kind of focuses on honing in on um, looking at directing federal policy to the protected area in the more northern Bering Sea uh, from a climate resiliency perspective. And so, um, as you can imagine, for a department like DHS, being able to engage with, um, with, with, the, with the task force is extremely important for us to develop those corporations because there's an element of the Bering Task Force in which we partner very closely with a tribal advisory council, and we work close hand-in-hand -hand to look at the issues and the concerns in the region from a biodiversity as well as a climate area uh, and to look to establish solutions to those, uh, to those uh, threats. And it, cannot, and it cannot be done, certainly, without the engagement of of the indigenous um, perspective. And so being able to engage there with the department is really important. And so I'll close really quickly by saying we're really looking forward to engaging with the White House and on the national strategy for the action uh, for the Ar Arctic region to be part of that implementation um, and also look to then develop DHS strategies and strategic approaches, but certainly working with our tribal communities to do so. Again, very excited to be here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Pippolet. Admiral? Thanks, Dr. Pincus, and uh, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. And, you know, as, as I listen to our Deputy Secretary and think about how fluent he was in all of the tenets of what is a, you know, really intense multivariable calculus type of environment, it really helps organizations like the United States Coast Guard to be able to see the future, to be able to align on objectives, and really to be able to build on foundations that we think are well situated. And, and so, you know, fundamentally, Coast Guard is not new to what we call the Arctic region, and whether your view kind of curtails that into, you know, the land-based Alaskan environment or, you know, principally into some of the offshore U.S. exclusive economic zone waters or maybe branching further east, you know, as uh, Deputy Secretary alluded to, you know, there is an Atlantic component to this equation as well. Mindful of the fact that uh, we've got a number of uh, representatives of a number of those Arctic nations joining the forum here today as well. Maybe not on the panel, but, you know, that is our circle of influence. Uh, those are the partners that we want to connect with 
that we can drive on our mutual objectives. You know, but fundamentally, what we've found over our 150 years of experience operating in that region, you know, it's about being there. It's about presence. You know, that allows you to project your objectives. It allows you to partner, and it really allows you to have a firm understanding of the requirements and needs to be able to be successful in a unique operating domain. And so, you know, we're going to continue to build off of that lineage, but we're driven by things like that national level policy, that strategy, you know, that really is helping to focus the United States government efforts. That's articulating what are we trying to accomplish and who's part of that solution set. You know, fortunately for the Coast Guard, uh, you know, we've had a strategy dealing with the Arctic or issues since 2013, and we're already on our second instantiation of that. So it's really uplifting to watch other uh, leaders and advocacy in this region and, you know, to see the alignment. And so we're not out on an island. We're not off track. We're seeing that type of consensus uh, on the way forward. And we're going to keep driving on those issues. Now, the way we see the Coast Guard in this problem set uh, when we think about the U.S. government as a bridge for the Department of Homeland Security, a uh, organization that can connect to the Department of State and think about, you know, those diplomatic instruments that are necessary. How do we connect DHS to Department of Defense? You know, the, uh, the United States Coast Guard sits in that space rather effectively, and we manage in that arena across multiple mission sets, and so this isn't new to us. And so, uh, you know, we feel like we're uh, well positioned and postured to be able to help all of those additional stakeholder groups, you know, obtain the and achieve the types of things that they're concerned about, but consider the, the broader U.S. government equities. You know, and uh, when we think about peace and prosperity, particularly in this region of our globe, you know, whether it's uh, ice-covered waters or the land-based component, you know, it comes down to really adherence to some rules-based orders. You know, do all of the stakeholders view uh, their commitments and responsibilities in the same light. Unfortunately, that's not the case today. And we continue to see, you know, what some would call strategic competition, but it also is, you know, uh, nation states and other adversaries that are potentially looking to advance their interests over the will and maybe the, uh, the good order and discipline of the, the broader global maritime commons. And so, you know, we're making commitments to make sure that the Coast Guard can project where the United States needs us, maybe where the globe and some of the other Arctic nations expect us to operate. And so, you know, we're positioning not only our forces of today, but looking into the future as well. But fundamentally, the Coast Guard is an organization of partnerships, and we're leveraging, you know, multinational forums, whether it's the Arctic Council or our instantiation of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, you know, to try to make sure that we have connection to those that we want to hear their views. We want to operate in tandem. You know, likewise, international forums like the International Maritime Organization has a stake in this conversation. The Coast Guard operates in all of those domains and arenas, and we're going to continue to make sure that, uh, you know, we're capturing the essence of what's good for the United States, but more broadly, what's good for the globe. You know, so we'll keep working through all of those things. Uh, look forward to some opportunity to address your questions, to build out on things like our uh, you know, national capital asset uh, shipbuilding activity for our polar security cutters. We can talk about some of those uh, naval combatant engagements uh, that we've encountered uh, in the Arctic region. Um, and likewise, on the prevention and preparedness, you know, when we think about resilience, um, you know, the deputy uh, really summed up one of the most recent, you know, natural disasters in that region of our world. And, and the Coast Guard was prominent along with FEMA and other agencies making sure that, uh, you know, we're supporting our citizens, but hopefully we're working to the left of boom in many of those cases. So thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Kang. Great. Thanks to the Wilson Center and the Polar Institute for allowing me to speak at this uh, engagement uh, about the Arctic. The Arctic, especially within the context of Alaska, uh, is an interest to FEMA and the DHS writ large, and we understand the challenges of conducting pre-, during-, and post-event efforts in a remote and harsh environment. And as the rate of climate change impacts the operational environment, we anticipate to see an increase in both magnitude and frequency as, of disasters, as was mentioned, uh, not only in Alaska, but elsewhere. Uh, these, these possibilities, though, uh, increase in terms of coastal erosion, flooding, as well as the magnification of other hazards, which could lead to disasters. 
Fortunately, we've been working towards a forward posture to be able to deal with these pre, during, and post-disaster events in Alaska. And since 2014, our Alaska Area Office has developed capability and capacity to deal with all the phases of an event, from the fall sea storms to spring flooding, summer wildfires, and the 2018 earthquake in the recent Typhoon Merbach. FEMA has partnered with the state of Alaska, the interagency, to help people during, before, during, and after disasters. We do recognize there are unique risks to Alaska, just like everywhere else, but in the Arctic, the consequences are more pronounced. That's why we've developed the Alaska Earthquake Annex to address one of the more dangerous risks that includes a transportation feasibility study that minimizes the impacts of the tyranny of distance of the Okunis response. We've also addressed the significant and diverse Native Alaskan community by developing the, uh, the, na the first nationwide plan that addresses sovereign nations with, the, with region, FEMA Region 10 uh, in the tribal annex. But we can do more, and our agency has started to focus on resiliency. Uh, the pre-disaster activities cannot be simply about building capacity and capability, and we have to continue to improve the integration activities, grants, programs, technical assistances, hazard mitigation, preparedness in order to develop a culture that leads to sustained resilience at all levels. As we stay on watch, we always have to be ready. A prepared and resilient individual, community, state, and nation is best postured to address a wide range of security threats, as well as optimize FEMA's response in its no-fail mission of response and recovery. Uh, forums like this will allow the collective Arctic community to include FEMA, an opportunity to become better informed and to continuously improve our tradecraft which is evolving from a reaction to a discipline of emergency management. Thank you very much. Mr. Hammer. Great. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you uh, on behalf of the 300 plus uh, uh, men and women of HSI, uh, special agents and uh, intelligence analysts that are working across the Pacific Northwest uh, in our two, soon to be three offices uh, in Alaska. Uh, it's really an honor to be uh, here today to discuss this topic. Um, HSI finds itself working uh, with its interagency partners on a daily basis to ensure the security, both locally and nationally, uh, of the Alaskan region, the Arctic in general, as well as working to ensure a level playing field for our technological and economic interests in our competitive environment with Russia and China. HSI is investing new resources and taking innovative approaches to accomplish this vision through three key, key areas. First, we are leading the way uh, nationally in the Pacific Northwest under Operation Red Umbrella, which is designed to target Chinese-supported organizations uh, that are conducting criminal activities uh, throughout the region, uh, both state and non-state sponsored. Uh, under this initiative, we're working closely with the FBI, the Department of Defense, and others to focus on counterintelligence operations in the region. Uh, these operations uh, serve to inform China about local political interests, uh, provide information about U.S. military capabilities, as well as lay the groundwork for sensitive technology exportation from the various research institutions in the region. Uh, FBI Director Ray has, has testified to Congress most recently uh, that they are seeing non-traditional Chinese collectors in the field, in every field office of the FBI, and the Arctic region has not been exempt uh, from that assessment. Our second focus is on targeting uh, the illegitimate trade uh, through the region. The Deputy Secretary talks so much about the importance of trade through the region, and so we're really focusing our efforts on partnering with uh, CBP on identifying illegitimate trade through the region. Uh, what we're seeing on the importation front on the ground up there uh, is a large amount of counterfeit goods coming into the country. Uh, we're seeing fraudulent IDs. We're seeing firearms uh, silencers. Uh, uh, firearms modification switches coming in to make them uh, fully automatic, and of course, a large amount of fentanyl-related substances coming in from the Asian continent. Um, we also look at the exports. So we're not only are we looking at what's coming into the country, we're trying to make sure we're controlling what's going out of the country as well. And uh, that's a critical piece that we believe in securing not only the nation, uh, but Alaska is really one of the key last points of departure as we talk about the Ted Stevens Airport and the importance of that as one of the key nodes uh, of that region. And so we're focusing a lot of resources on that airport to make sure we're identifying uh, cargo coming in and out of that, of that region. Finally, and most importantly, I think, um, we're investing into the local Arctic community as a whole. Uh, Alaska is a vast domain, and, and really, unless you have been there, you can't really comprehend the remoteness of, of Alaska. 
Um, and that's a challenge. Uh, and so in order to increase uh, our, our demand awareness, but more importantly, increase the trust and partnership with the communities that we are sworn to protect, uh, we're, we're really doubling down on our partnership development on a couple of fronts. First, we're really trying to invest in our state and local agency training, uh, providing the technical expertise that we have with the federal law enforcement to give that technical expertise to the state and local governments and, and, and aid them in developing their own capabilities on the ground. Uh, additionally, we're working hard uh, with non-governmental organizations on the ground there to support our efforts with human trafficking and child exploitation. Um, and it's really only through these efforts that we're going to be successful um, in achieving the first two goals that I talked about. And so they're, they're really interrelated. So I really look forward to having the conversation with you guys today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all to the um, senior folks in this panel for introductory comments that have really, I think, framed out a number of very important issues um, that all revolve around this um, sort of nexus of security that Ambassador Bolton spoke about. It's security is, is, a, is a broad term, and we can see the range of different topics that fall underneath it. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in, um, and I think I'm going to first bundle up a few questions. Um, hopefully I don't make too much of a mess of this because there are three separate ones that I'm going to mash together into a Frankenstein question. Um, and I think it may be relevant for all of your operations, which is why I'm going to do that. We've gotten in questions about what I'm going to call enablers. So um, roads and surface transportation, um, ports, and um, also the polar security cutter, the icebreaker. So thinking about enablers for the critical work that you do and that you are coordinating in the Arctic, um, what do you think are some of the most significant enablers that um, maybe have come on board in the last couple of years or key capabilities that you're looking forward to in the next few years that will help you achieve some of the objectives and strategies that you've just discussed? Um, and I'm, I'm happy to go in the order we started before unless someone really wants to jump on that. But this would be a question about sort of critical enablers and connectors. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just kick it off, but uh, I think the real experts are sitting to our left, Rebecca. Uh, two things come to mind. Uh, one you didn't mention or the questioner didn't mention is actually uh, communications. Mm -hmm. uh, in the far north, uh, communications are uh, not as good, not as uh, easy to undertake as they are uh, elsewhere. And what I'm hoping in the next few years is we will see a continued build out of broadband, which will help uh, in all sorts of ways, including to affect the missions, the many missions that DHS has. Um, of the other forms of um, infrastructure, I would say, uh, building out the deep water port in Nome uh, is something of great promise. It will allow uh, quite a lot of things to happen that can't happen yet as far north as there, uh, including as perhaps uh, a home port for a future polar security cutter. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. And I actually really appreciate that question. I, I like how Ambassador Bolton kind of teed this up. So from a DHS policy perspective, and I think that the Deputy Secretary alluded to this uh, somewhat in, in his remarks, uh, you know, uh, all, those, all those pieces are really important. But understanding the complexity and, and, and the urgency of engagement in the region, not from just a U.S. Coast Guard perspective, but also a CISA perspective, a TSA perspective, a CBP perspective, FEMA, et cetera, is really important. And I think when we get that signal from leadership, as you certainly heard today, that trickles down into the policy and the priorities in which our policy office certainly will be communicating across our components. And so that is something that I think that's a really important aspect. And so certainly would allow them to talk specifically about those enablers, but just talking about it from a policy perspective perspective, certainly that's a, that's a key piece and knowing it's on our radar um, to push out. Thanks, Doctor. And, uh, you know, when we think about what's emerging in that region, you know, it is uh, a little daunting that we're seeing an uptick in human activity, whether it's ecotourism, whether it's, uh, you know, offshore fisheries, um, the lack of infrastructure there that we're typically as a response and humanitarian organization that we're uh, relying upon to be able to execute how we normally conduct support operations, response activities, doing the things that the American public expects the United States Coast Guard to do, some of those enablers are th aren't there. They are meager. And so we want to continue to see that development. The ambassador mentioned communications. And I'd say I'd extend that to awareness. You know, what do we not know about what's happening, not only in the interior of Alaska, but beyond, you know, out into our EEZ as well? Um, 
presence becomes important because that's how you understand really what's transpiring there. And today we've got, you know, a little bit of a void in that uh, awareness, uh, maybe a lot of a void in that awareness. We need to continue to see those services develop. Uh, the Coast Guard will be more effective. The DHS partnerships and families will be more effective. Uh, but our citizens expect that. And I think our government, when you look at our strategies, you know, we're setting the bar higher because we want to be able to advance into that space. Part of it will be commercial, part of it will be tribal, part of it will be the will of the citizens, and then the investments of our, our nation as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about the polar security cutter and some of the other uh, you know, shipbuilding activities that we have going on. But uh, that's, you know, enablers are important. Thank you. So from FEMA's perspective, uh, just kind of look at it from a pre-disaster, during disaster, and post-disaster. So during pre-disaster phases, we're a consumer of the infrastructure enablers. So we'll benefit that uh, in terms of pushing flow of information, pushing goods and services, uh, as well as finance. Uh, so during the disaster, we then we become the repairer of the enabler, and then re and during recovery, we reconstitute uh, of the enabler itself. So we look at it from a disaster phase perspective as a not only a consumer, but <laughs> <laughs> repair as well as reconstitution. Uh, and for, for that to happen, uh, what FEMA brings is the Stafford Act when a disaster is declared, so that way we can manage both uh, ends of the bookends of the disaster phases. But from a consequence management perspective, we definitely see multiple hats and, and phases uh, and, and, con and perspectives of enablers. From the HSI perspective on the ground up there, I, th I think uh, for us, what, in, in what enables our mission is uh, going back again to the partnerships. I, again, we get a call that there's uh, uh, a victim of, of, of human trafficking or a victim of uh, child exploitation. Um, that typically is a six to eight hour in, in endeavor for us to get to that victim because of the remoteness of these, these individuals. And so we rely heavily on folks such as the Coast Guard, do Alaska State Troopers. We have literally put our vehicles onto Coast Guard C-130s and had them move us to that remote area in order to uh, execute our mission. And so again, relying the reliance on uh, our interagency partners, both at, at, at federal and, and local levels, really is critical for us in order to be able to execute our mission, given the remoteness of, of Alaska. And you know, on the horizon, obviously, you know, the solution to that is, uh, is uh, decentralized uh, from our, our, our primary points in Juneau and, and Anchorage. And we're doing that. And we're doing that through the increased awareness of the importance of the Arctic, uh, such as the, the policy that Dr. Hippolyte is, is, is working on here at the department level. Uh, and already we're seeing the tangential effects of that, where we got approval this year, fiscal year, to double uh, this, the size of our offices in, in, in uh, Alaska. So that's going to be a huge increase of resources to try and, again, reduce that response time uh, that we can respond to the communities uh, up there in Alaska. Let, let me just confirm, you're doubling your office in Alaska this year. Yes. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Excellent. Um, breaking news. Thank you. Um, great. That I, What an interesting way to kick off this discussion, because I think we got very practical very fast, and I really appreciate that. Um, and a lot of you have touched on some of the issues that are sort of common challenges, like the remoteness, um, like communications. I appreciate you bringing that up, Ambassador. Um, so first, great first question. I want to see if there's any questions here in the room before I go back to our online audience. If you have a question, please throw your hand up, and you will receive a microphone. Um, I will give you a couple more minutes to think about that because we do have a few more coming in. We got a really interesting question about Canada. Um, and I'm not sure, again, I feel like all of you could speak to that and, and we'll burn through time if, if all of you tackle all of the questions. But in terms of partnering with Canada and how well your agency works across jurisdictional lines and that international boundary, does anyone want to touch on that? And, you know, Ambassador, I'll throw that to you first obviously with your State Department background, but I'm sure there's going to be some interesting sort of Canada relationship answers from the rest of the panel. So maybe you could kick us off with just a, a couple notes maybe about the NSAR. Sure. The, um, the truth is that, the, that Canada is the nation in the Arctic we work, work with most closely by far. Um, and it's not just a matter of geography. We have ties that uh, go much deeper than that and system, national systems that are similar. We have commitments to our First Nations and Alaska Natives uh, that are similar in nature. Uh, and we tend, especially in these, the current Canadian and U.S. administrations, tend to look at the world in the same way. So there's uh, a lot of 
uh, we're off, we often find ourselves with Canada pushing on open doors, and I think they would say the same of us. I'll stop there. Right. And I, I would build on that. Uh, you know, when I think of it militarily, you know, Canada is an intrinsic partner in the NORTHCOM NORAD relationship. And on that northern border from a, whether you call it homeland security, uh, bridging into homeland defense, you know, they are there mm -hmm. uh, each and every day. And we really do uh, appreciate uh, that relationship. And then as I focus, you know, more into the maritime schemes, as the ambassador alluded to, we have established agreements with our counterparts within the Canadian government, both on the law enforcement side, but also into their Coast Guard and uh, some of their regulatory agencies as well, so that we can manage, you know, across our common maritime boundaries. Um, you know, we work with them in an ice-breaking capacity. Uh, we talk with them as we want to transit through the Northwest Passage. Uh, Healy recently completed a circumnavigation around North America, you know, supported by Canadians where appropriate as well. And so, you know, we share common views. Uh, we share uh, those consortiums and those forums. And, and I think we partner extremely well uh, with uh, them as our northern neighbors, but also with uh, a common view of the world. So from uh, FEMA's perspective, we see Canada as an important partner in terms of mutual aid, uh, knowing that Southeast Alaska is uh, but right next to Canada. So as we look at response and the tyranny of distance, getting it from the lower 48, uh, Canada plays an important part in when, uh, managing the expectation of, of response assets during those golden hours. And so for us, executing that mutual aid through the State Department is going to be key uh, when we look at disaster response in Alaska. And from us, from the enforcement side of the house, uh, we really partner heavily with, with Canada on cross-border smuggling in, in events in terms of information sharing, the criminal networks that are, are uh, exploiting uh, different holes in our, in our security systems uh, to make sure that we're able to plug those and intercept those um, individuals. We actually have um, folks embedded within uh, the Canadian law enforcement and vice versa. We have RCMP and CBSA on our side of the border partnering with us as well for that real-time information exchange on those cases. Great. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, for Dr. Hippolyte that I'm, again, going to sort of zoom out and see if anyone else wants to jump on it, because it was a question about what you heard at the um, tribal listening session from the uh, Alaska Native tribes. And I think um, I want to hear more about that as well, but I also want to sort of build from that to a broader question, because so many of you have touched on the unique, unique ways in which your agencies partner with Alaska Natives and um, the, the sort of unique um, tribal authorities and responsibilities in the region. Um, and I think that's a, a something that folks who haven't spent a lot of time in Alaska don't often appreciate. And so I'm wondering if we could first toss that question, question to you, ma'am, but then if anyone else would be willing to comment on sort of the ways you work with Alaska Native communities and maybe some of the unique aspects up there that, that folks in the audience and watching online might not fully appreciate. Because I think it's, it's a tremendously important part of your work in, in Alaska, in the broader Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And so certainly uh, during the, the listening session, one of the, the key aspects that was brought out was the concept of disaster preparedness, right? Because mm -hmm. it was front and center on, on a lot of folks' mind um, uh, considering the typhoon. And so how do, you, how do you get ahead of that? How do you prepare for that? And so certainly how do we get insight um, from, from our tribal communities and our tribal leaders um, in terms of the best way to position DHS and its vast components to be in a position to, to, to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that's something that you'll see in probably the strategies and, and the responses that you'll hear from my colleagues here, that, that that is front and center. But that was really near and dear to, to them. I think the other aspect of, of that uh, that, I, that I heard during the listening session was just as we began to develop solutions to problems that we talk about collectively as an interagency in the region, that we include them and that they be a part of the conversation, that they be at the table when we're making those solutions because they have a, a unique perspective. And I think those were the two things um, from, from that listening session that I really took to heart. And so certainly echoing the fact as we move forward from a department on our policies, we will certainly look to engage with our tribal communities on, on, those, on those efforts. I would just say, uh, you know, Rear Admiral Nate Moore, who is our district commander for the Coast Guard up in that region, he fully understands the relevance and significance of, you know, that faction of populace. Uh, there is nobody better steeped in the understanding of that environment or, and, you know, what history has shown us. And so, you know, he has a tribal affairs officer that makes sure that we connect uh, to understand, you know, what is their posture and position when we have emerging maritime issues. 
you know, it's things like uh, while we may not regulate them for subsistence fishing, we do want to talk to them about the perils of the sea and, you know, what response type uh, procedures might be in play. How do we provide some counsel and guidance about, you know, appropriate uh, life-saving equipment and other capabilities that can keep uh, their citizens, you know, uh, safe when they're operating in a dangerous environment. And so that notion of resilience and readiness is important. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, we're mindful of uh, the battle rhythm that their citizens and, uh, you know, their, uh, their members really operate under and try to position our assets to be postured and prepared to be responsive. You know, we run an operation annually that moves a number of our helicopters north so that we can uh, be in the right spot if things go wrong. Um, you know what, we engage with uh, bulk fuel facilities so that we can look for things that, uh, you know, can improve the safety and, you know, avoid environmental disasters. Uh, so, you know, it's an all-inclusive relationship and we need to just continue to be mindful of the views and uh, objectives that they have as well. Great. So every disaster in Alaska has a Native Alaskan in input towards it, um, whether it be even within your bigger community like at Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau. Uh, so that's already built in towards uh, how the Alaska op Area Office, the state of Alaska, addresses disasters. Uh, there, obviously, there's a big cultural component of it uh, that, uh, that we have to be cognizant, but also the seasonality of Alaska, that's better than the culture. So for example, uh, nothing gets done in July and August <laughs> just because of subsistence living uh, to include uh, our urban Alaskan uh, 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 partners. So uh, that's, it's already built in within the context and how we actually deliver aid uh, and resources. So for example, when you're building houses in a smaller community or a village, um, you have to, instead of uh, using the R1-2 insulation, you have to use R20, you know, that's got to withstand not colder temperatures as well as uh, as well as high winds. So that's already built in within the Alaska, but we do have to build uh, uh, on the response side, but we have to build resiliency uh, as a nation, as well as individuals. Uh, and we have to incorporate the cultural piece in building the resiliency. Thanks. And I'll just echo kind of what everybody else is saying. I think ultimately what it comes down to is these communities want to be heard. They want to understand that somebody is out there to help them with the resources and, and authorities and capabilities that they bring to the table because uh, from uh, again, if you haven't been there, you, you, it's hard to put in context. A lot of these communities don't have, you can't pick up the phone and call the local police department or a fire. They don't have these things. They rely on, on the state police to come in from hours away or the federal government. And so uh, we're trying to be responsive to a victim first approach, a uh, victim centered approach, making sure uh, through the U.S. Attorney's Office that we've got uh, what's called the Raven Task Force, which is the Rural Alaska Anti Violence Team, uh, looking at the, the violence that's taking place in these rural communities and how we can leverage collective resources to try and help these victims out in whichever way we can. Great. I, guess I could add just a small piece to that. I'd be remiss if, if I didn't add this. Um, it was definitely echo to getting out to the region, right, and not just getting to Anchorage. And that was a part where we were talking about our consultations and looking to do that, not just looking to do them virtually, not just looking to get to Anchorage, but get to Bethel, get to Nome, get out to the Arctic Circle to really have an opportunity to see for yourself and mm -hmm. understand the aspects. And so that's a, a very key point that I wanted to make. Thank you. I'd just like to zoom out for a moment. If you work for the U.S. federal government, to work for the U.S. federal government is to have profound commitments to Native Americans generally, in this case, to Alaska Natives in particular, commitments that are both legal in nature and I would say moral in nature. And they are carried forward against the backdrop of a tortured, awful history that at best we are trying to rectify and through our actions today. Um, and I, and I, I started in the Reagan administration. I've been working <laughs> steadily through to today. And I would say that this administration seems even more committed to fulfilling that agenda than any of the ones that have preceded it. Uh, the Tribal Nations Summit that took place last fall is one echo of that. Uh, we recently issued guidance on including indigenous knowledge into all federal decisions wherever possible. Of course, that is true in Alaska particularly. The United States, I'd say, along with Canada and Denmark, are the champions of uh, Arctic indigenous people's participation in places like the Arctic Council and other uh, international settings. So we have both a lot to make up for, but also a lot to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you for that context setting. Um, and the um, administration's policy on traditional knowledge, I think, is really remarkable. Um, that was, didn't, I don't think it got quite enough attention when it came out, but it's really a game changer. It's, it's an important document for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, 
Okay, we have a few more questions coming in about national security, so I think I will again sort of mash them together. I apologize, um, but I, I think it's the best way to sort of tackle the, the large issues in the room. Russia, China, national security. We have questions for you, Admiral, about the Coast Guard's relationship with the Navy, um, but we also have questions coming in about you know some of the recent um, Russia and, and Chinese activity that we've seen in the region that you've alluded to. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe, if all of you or, or a sampling of you would like to comment on how you, how your agency is perceiving Russian and Chinese activities in the region and how you characterize and maybe prioritize responding to them. Obviously, we have um, global challenges relating to um, competitors and um, areas, global areas that are hot spots, which, which is not the Arctic right now, but can you talk a little bit about how we can understand what's happening there and maybe put it in the broader context? Um, and I'll st I might ask you, Admiral, to go first just because you've, you've gotten a, a couple of mention in these questions. Thanks, Doctor. Up close and personal, that's how we're viewing Russia and China in the maritime in the Arctic, um, literally and figuratively. Uh, you know, we're seeing Russian naval combatants sometimes operating in tandem in a surface action group with Chinese vessels. Mm -hmm. And so by having some of our national security cutters in proximity and present, we're able to observe where they're operating, and, and they have been present in our EEZ, um, understanding what are they doing together, maybe trying to decipher what are their objectives and intent. Um, so again, it comes down to being able to see and uh, be, av be available with the right capability to be able to engage and, and represent the United States where, where appropriate. And so we're seeing that type of maritime activity. You know, fortunately, again, our national security cutters were able to operate, you know, up close to the ice edge, but, but they are not icebreakers. And uh, probably a good place to, to parlay that into what are we doing to replace those 40-plus-year-old assets that were designed really to be able to break ice and maneuver to where the United States wanted to go, but doing that with a broader aperture with the mind of security. So our new class of cutters, the polar security cutters, are – you know, going through the detailed design to be able to be launched in the next few years. That will give the Coast Guard and the United States the right capability to get to the high latitudes where and when we need to, and whatever those emerging mission requirements might be, taking with it, you know, a healthy uh, aviation complement and contingent as well, along with other sensors and capabilities that, you know, may allow them to operate either autonomously or independently, maybe where we have some gaps in the other infrastructure uh, that we might typically rely upon, but you know we're really excited about that shipbuilding endeavor. You know our 27th commandant, her first tour afloat when she graduated from the Coast Guard Academy was on Polar Star. No kidding. That vessel is over 40 years old, currently operating down in Antarctica today, supporting the National Science Foundation in McMurdo. But represented the fact that you know it was already a decade old when she was on there, and uh, you know she's fairly seasoned in our service. She's looking forward to, to really spawning a new class of cutters, and I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't point out also our, op, our offshore patrol cutter, which will operate in the high latitudes, which will carry about 70% of our offshore mission uh, capacity and capability. So, you know, we're mindful of uh, those other nations that are operating in that region. We're going to see more presence up there, and we need to be able to decipher their intent and be able to, uh, you know, project the Coast Guard's and the United States sovereignty as well. Great. Thank you. So if I can, so uh, although FEMA is not a traditional instrument of power for the nation, uh, we, we do have a unique role in homeland defense and consequence management. So if something were to happen direct or indirect, right, there's going to be some sort of disaster declaration, most likely if it impacted people and infrastructure, a Stafford Act. So we see ourselves looking forward in the consequence management realm of a nation state direct or indirect attack. So for example, um, for us, we seem to be getting uh, uh, more involved in these non-Stafford Act events. Uh, and so in, in from a security standpoint, if there was something that happened to a community uh, within, within Alaska, we would provide that consequence management piece. So we are very cognizant of the Homeland Defense mission that the DOD provides, particularly NORAD and NORTHCOM. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we understand that we do have to support the, the states and locals if something were to happen. 
That's a great point. I really appreciate you making that. And it's so interesting when we think about some of the attacks on critical infrastructure that we've seen in the last year um, around the Arctic region. I think it's it's really great to frame that response in terms of, of uh, the sort of consequence management. I appreciate that. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, from the national security investigation standpoint, yep. trying to uh, prevent consequence management. Um, we really uh, are assessing, uh, you know, your question on assessing, I think, is, is consistent with what the Admiral talked about, is this the notion of uh, probing, if you will, trying to, to understand what our uh, reactions are going to be, where are we postured, um, you know, who's responding, who's doing what. And I think we're seeing that through direct uh, probing, and then we see that through technological probing. probing. Uh, we, we've seen uh, a lot of UAS activity across Alaska in, as, in support of these things. And, and so the question over to us is, you know, we're coming together with the interagency team teams, uh, with the Bureau of the Intelligence Community and others to say, you know, what is the why behind this and what is the intent and trying to understand that and then wh where do we adapt our capabilities uh, to deter these uh, moving forward. And so uh, we also uh, are also uh, doubling down efforts within the, uh, as I mentioned before, the technology exportation uh, arena and, and the exploit. Uh, there's a lot of research centers and national labs in the region uh, that are doing really sensitive uh, research. And we want to make sure that we are plugged in appropriately through direct outreach to those uh, educational and academic communities uh, in, in protection of that research from going back overseas. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, pivoting from that, from the sort of national security threats, maybe the more pointy end of the, the security um, concept to another topic that you have all touched on, that the Deputy Secretary touched on, um, that we're getting a couple of questions about climate change. And, you know, I think it, it this conversation has teed up this issue so well because we're talking so much about how security spills over from um, actor competitors to phenomena anything with consequences, right? We want to, as, a, as an interagency, get out ahead of those consequences and prevent them, but also respond and minimize the damage to Americans. Um, and so can we talk, we got a question about specifically um, climate mitigation and mm -hmm. its place in the NSAR, mm -hmm. but I'm, I want to sort of ask that question, but also ask more broadly what your agencies are doing, not only to improve resilience, which some of you have talked about, um, and maybe cli climate adaptation. We know Alaska is confronting enormous challenges in terms of um, the wildfires, coastal erosion, community relocation, permafrost thaw, and the impacts on infrastructure there. Um, so adaptation, resilience and potentially mitigation. Um, and again, we'll start with, with Ambassador Baldwin and then see if, if any of you else can comment on this important set of issues. Thanks. So climate change in the Arctic, as I said up front, is one of the two greatest challenges, greatest threats I think the region is facing along with increased geostrategic stress. Um, in the first uh, discussion between uh, Mike Srega and John Teen, it, uh, it was noted that the Arctic is warming, depending on how you measure it, uh, four times as fast on average as the rest of the planet. And it's already having profound consequences. Uh, in the national strategy, uh, there is one thing I recall relating to mitigation. Mostly mitigation is not Arctic specific, but there uh, is a commitment to reduce emissions of black carbon in the Arctic. In, uh, emissions of it in the Arctic are particularly pernicious there because it has the effect of uh, reducing the albedo effect by turning white surfaces dark and allowing for the absorption of more heat. There is a lot in the national strategy about adaptation, and you've already touched on a number of the um, elements of that. The one, to me, most critical and sort of mind-boggling is the fact that a very significant number of communities around the coast of Alaska are almost certainly going to need either to relocate entirely or to engage in what is called managed retreat or perhaps protect in place. And we are just at the beginning of helping those communities uh, figure out what their strategies are and provide resources to them to affect those strategies. This is going to take many years and a lot of time and a lot of money to do effectively, not only in Alaska, but I would say primarily in Alaska. Thank you. So from the Coast Guard perspective, you know, from our own internal view, about 10% of our infrastructure is located in Alaska. And so, you know, we're mindful of uh, what does that resilience posture look like? Are we doing the right things from an engineering and uh, a design 
perspective to make sure we're ready for the future. But I think operationally, it's about consequence and understanding you know, what might we encounter because the climate is changing. And that ranges everywhere from migrating fish stocks you know, that are going into the colder waters up north. Are we ready for fishing fleets, despite, as the Secretary pointed out, different treaty uh, instruments? You know, that world is changing. We need to be prepared to deal with those emerging requirements. Increased vessel traffic will not only bring, you know, that, uh, that notion of um, being ready to support uh, the maritime transportation system, not only from a compliance and regulatory perspective, but from a potential uh, casualty and mishap response. You know, who's going to be there to enforce Polar Code compliance, if not the Coast Guard? And so, you know, that is part of our fabric. And then just the broader response and readiness that I talked about, more traffic, more activity means likely more accidents and more response requirements. And, uh, you know, both from a humanitarian perspective and a, a instrument of the United States goes to SCAR, we need to be ready to, uh, to operate up there as well. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment? Uh, so, so from, a, from the disaster <laughs> agency, so we're always keen on disruptions of patterns of life, right, which causes a, a, a disaster declaration. Uh, so we're very uh, cognizant of the impacts towards climate change. So the couple of things that our agency is doing is we've, uh, we're, uh, we've changed one of our preparedness uh, or directorates into uh, a resiliency. So we're focusing on resiliency, building that collective uh, capacity uh, throughout. Uh, and, and in addition, so in, in that line, we're looking at risk reduction investments through programs, through, through, through grants, uh, funding as well. So those are the two things that we are looking to build up, not only capacity, but, but studying and how, that, uh, look, how the uh, climate change impacts are disrupting the pattern of life. Could you give us an example? Would it be possible just to sort of make concrete when you talk about sort of risk reduction investments? What that Absolutely. Like? So there's a, there's four phases within the disaster cycle, right? At response, recovery, preparedness, and hazard mitigation. There are others as well, prevent, protect. Uh, but hazard mitigation is one of the phases where we're trying to reduce the vulnerability of risk, right? Either through risk reduction, uh, like elevating houses, for example, would be one. Uh, so we understand the communities in peril, the, the initiative in Alaska that started in 2006 where we had six communities in peril that was provided. Uh, so we understand relocation may be a mechanism to risk reduce uh, risk itself, and that's an investment. So those are the, some of the strategies in terms of money, grant programs, right, uh, flow of goods and services as well uh, to bring down risk. Uh, so we understand that there are multiple variables to include global uh, climate change uh, that may impact the pattern of life. This is just one portfolio because at the end of the day, we're going to have to clean up on all five. So, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I can imagine for FEMA, trying to buy down risk is a very different approach. Um, but when you look at sort of the dollars spent on preventing versus responding, I'm sure there's a, a huge payoff. Yes, there is. Yeah. If you can uh, make that case to Congress, uh, right? Yes, right. Exactly. And then we have to navigate within what we can do, what we'd like to do. Uh, we're constrained by, by budgets as well. So, Interesting. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I want to fit in one more question in the couple of minutes we have left, unless there's any pressing questions from the audience here, um, because I, we, I do want to bring up sort of the topic that, that we haven't covered yet, which is Russia and the impact on the sort of cross-strait relationship. Admiral, I'm sure you're going to have some things to say. Um, the Coast Guard patrols a maritime boundary with Russia, and over the course of the last year, um, that relationship has certainly become more challenging for you. Ambassador, perhaps you could comment on the pause in the Arctic Council, where we're anticipating that going. But I'm sure for all of you, you know, thinking about crime flows across that boundary, um, or potentially a disaster response that might take place in, you know, adjacent waters, um, what, how has the last year changed what you're doing and where do you see it going in the future? And, and Ambassador, do you mind kicking us off? Thanks. Well, perhaps I'll start where you suggested with the Arctic Council. Um, John Tien already mentioned that soon after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine last February, the other seven Arctic states announced a pause in all Arctic Council activities um, during what is still the Russian chairmanship. Uh, that was amended uh, early in the summer to say that we would resume activities involving Arctic Council projects that don't include Russian participation. Um, Russia, through its actions, has made it 
effectively impossible for the United States and the others to cooperate with Russia in the Arctic. And this is a very serious knock-on effect of the invasion of Ukraine. There is a lot being lost because of this. Um, Norway will take over as chair in May, as already mentioned. Uh, there are unanswered questions about what will happen with, this, or with regard to Russian participation in the Council following the change in chairmanships. I suspect a lot of it will have to do with what's going on on the ground in Ukraine and the attitudes among the seven, which are not unanimous necessarily, but reasonably like-minded, I would say. Um, it's not good times for the Arctic Council. I watched the Council grow from a very small, not well-known institution when it was first created uh, to uh, the premier forum uh, for Arctic diplomacy, uh, certainly over the last decade. And right now, it is not functioning very well. Um, I would hope over time it can return to being the force for good that it has been. Uh, but a lot of that depends on Russia. Thank you. If I, if I may add a piece to that, separate and apart from the Arctic Council, the uh, Department of Homeland Security maintains a very robust um, engagement with our international partners, particularly in the region. So we have bilateral relationships and engagement with them. And so during this time, those engagements of pursuing information sharing, of just ensuring that we have um, a great collaboration and partnership re remain very, very prominent in the work that we're doing. So we'll continue to pursue those relationships and pursue those partnerships, um, particularly as it relates to, to, to the Arctic and the area. Thank you. I think, as, as the ambassador pointed out, with the Arctic Council, you know, underneath that umbrella, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum is suffering in the same sense. Uh, you know, we're missing opportunity to be able to do things collectively uh, that will uh, prepare us for the future. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it really is uh, as a result of Russia's uh, actions itself. You know, we uh, we still continue to have some engagement with the Russian Border Guard, um, mainly from a safety of life at sea issue. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, those in peril on the waters, you know, aren't uh, disenfranchised because of both a political and a uh, international discourse issue. So there, there is some low-level interactions, but uh, it's not as rich, as robust as it needs to be. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue to operate and project where the United States uh, is compelled to do so and then look for uh, that rules-based order that can help us to advance, you know, for the good of the, the world. Sure. So, so FEMA's got a small part, not to Russia, but what Russia can impact in terms of the defense of support to civil authorities. Yeah. Uh, so more often than not, uh, we rely on DOD as a resource provider. And so as we, as we saw in Ukraine and Russia, as DOD shifts their focus into a uh, peer-to-peer, nation-state type of activity, we may not have the availability of a, of a, uh, of a marine uh, expeditionary unit that happened to be circling around Puerto Rico when, the, when 2017 hit. Uh, so we see uh, our resources being constrained a little bit uh, as we look as the DOD looks towards Russia uh, and start to posture towards that. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's I hadn't thought about that, but I appreciate that sort of reframing. Thanks. Yeah. So from the agency perspective, and I'll talk both uh, regionally here in Alaska as well as globally, what we're doing. Um, HSI was really front and center on, um, on the recent landing of two individuals out in the Aleutian Islands that came across. Uh, you know, in the initial fog of war, it was, oh, two, two Russian military members had come across. And so there was a lot of concern about, oh, is this what's actually happened? And it ended up being uh, individuals that were fleeing conscription, obviously. But, um, you know, it, it, it begged the question, are we prepared? Is, are things changing? Is this a, is this a, is this a route? Is this both a, a humanitarian possibility as well as a, maybe a bad actor possibility, if, if, depending on how things go. And so these are the conversations that we begin having with the interagency team up there, Coast Guard and Border Patrol at CBP, uh, to make sure that the department was prepared for any type of contingency that may come out of the Russian-Ukrainian war, especially uh, within the, the Bering Strait there. Um, I think uh, we continue to focus globally on identifying the assets of uh, Russian uh, oligarchs and other things and make those seizures of yachts and, and all the things that you see in the news. And so the department is very engaged in that uh, through HSI. And then um, we are all actively engaged in, through, I mentioned our counterproliferation efforts in terms of stopping technology from leaving. Uh, there are drones that are being recovered over in Ukraine uh, that are being used by the Russians, uh, you know, provided by uh, the Iranians, et cetera. Uh, and doing the analysis of, uh, you know, uh, some of the open source reporting on that shows that there's a large contingent of American-made parts that are being used in those drones, uh, working that back, trying to uh, identify the supply lines uh, 
fun, fun, uh, fueling uh, the, the, the parts going over to the, to the Middle East. Um, I'll note that the Wilson Center just this morning hosted discussion on that very topic, so check out our website for more. There's a terrific report. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think, I think, again, we can see sort of, as you said, Ambassador, the knock-on effects of the, the invasion in Ukraine have touching so many different parts of across the DHS enterprise. Um, so thank you for that. We are out of time. I want to ask, I want to thank all of my panelists and ask you all for really quick, you know, closing comments. If there's anything that we haven't touched on that I have failed to ask you about that you want to share with us or any final thoughts before um, we exit the stage and um, please take us away with a couple closing comments. I'm actually heartened by the way the federal government has been coming together around Arctic issues over the last few years. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of energy. I can feel it in talking to my interagency colleagues. Uh, we have good uptake, I think, from people in the state. And with the serious exception of Russia, we have very good cooperation among the other Arctic nations with whom we have to work. So while we have twin problems, climate and just strategic problems, we also have a lot of assets on which to draw. Great. Thank you. And I just would close by saying that, you know, the, dealing with the Arctic issues is certainly a whole of government effort. And so while we, the Department of Homeland Security, are here today talking about our role in this space, we work very closely with our interagency partners. And we will continue to do so, obviously, with the close collaboration with the White House. And so I just think that that's really going to position us to be uh, in a place where we're going to be able to put forth good policy, a sound policy as relates to address the issues and concerns and opportunities in the Arctic region in the future. I would just close out by saying, uh, you know, that DHS leadership in this space is, is really encouraging. You know, looking at uh, Homeland Security as a national security issue, uh, but also bringing the power of 22 agencies together in a concerted effort. You know, that's really encouraging. And to have, you know, our senior department leaders fluent and well-versed in this space gives us a lot of move room and opportunity to achieve even more. In the Indeed. Future. So thank you. Yeah. I think as we address the Arctic uh, and the uncertainties of the Arctic, uh, you can see the unity of effort that the department provides. Uh, we just need to continue to synchronize those efforts so we can optimize how we look at the Arctic. Yeah. Now we're just like everybody's comments. I just want to appreciate you uh, for hosting the, the conversation. It's a much ne it's a needed conversation as not only does the geopolitical uh, situation changes, but there's a lot of fundamental things that the department is responding to that are on the ground in Alaska outside of the geopolitical things that the ambassador talks about. And I think it's just having these types of discussions helps the general public understand uh, some of the things that may not be front and center, but th that are taking place that the department's bringing to the, uh, to that region every day. Yeah, thank you. I, and, and I really, you know, I learned a lot about DHS and its components today. I think I have a much fuller appreciation of the incredible scope of work that goes on and the complexities of managing across, you know, 22 different um, components. And I think it's a great illustration for how the interagency process works. You know, the United States government is huge and sprawling and- it's a seamless web, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> And so many different pieces of a touch on the Arctic, right? And so I think we, we took a, we sort of pulled back the, the curtains a little bit and looked at how a corner of it, the Department of Homeland Security is working on this, um, and seamlessly, of course. Um, and I, I appreciate you closing us out with some optimistic comments, and I would agree that the, the senior leader interest in this space is really heartening. Um, so let's keep watching this space. We're really looking forward to welcoming the United States Arctic Research Commission and some of the U.S. interagency Arctic science actors to our next event on the national strategy, and that'll be February 15th, um, announcements to come. So we're, we're sort of working our way through the NSAR pillars um, and, you know, covered some really interesting security topics today. Science is coming up next, but I want to thank all of our panelists, Ambassador Bolton, Dr. Hippolyte, Admiral Ryan, Mr. Kang, Mr. Hammer, just a fantastic time. Thank again the Deputy Secretary, um, and thank our audience for coming today, both in person and online. We really appreciate you coming out, and uh, with that, we're going to wrap up. Thanks so much, and thank you all. <laughs>